Welcome to the background lecture for Lab 0 of Electrical Circuits 1. The related lecture material for this lab assignment is primarily in lectures 1 and 2. You should have also watched lectures A, B, C, and D by this time. The related written material are in sections 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. Since this is our first lab assignment, I have some general comments about the overall structure of the labs. One thing that I want to point out is that lab assignments may lead the lectures slightly at times. On occasion, I feel that it is helpful to see a concept in the lab before introducing the mathematics. It will give you a context within which to place the math. I don't always do that, but sometimes I will. If I do introduce a concept in the lab before you see it in the lectures, I will give you a brief background on that concept. I won't completely discuss the concept, but I will give you enough information to get through the lab. Later, concepts such as that will be formally introduced in later lab assignments. At that time, you should have the theoretical background to understand the details. So the lab assignments will tend to be recursive to some degree. You may see a topic more than once in different labs. Be sure that you do not forget what we have done in previous lab assignments when you go on to the next lab assignment. In general, the structure of the lab assignments is that each assignment will consist of multiple parts. There will be multiple exercises to perform in each assignment. Now, each of these parts will generally provide you with a general discussion, which provides some background information about that topic. There will be some pre-lab assignments. Those generally consist of doing some analysis or doing some background research on the topic that that section of the lab assignment is about. Please do the lab assignments before attempting to go through the lab exercises. The exercises will make more sense if you've done the background material. The final section of each lab assignment part will be the lab procedures. Those describe processes that are to be done in the lab or on your EE board and will describe data to be taken and circuits to be wired, etc. Now, the way we set up submissions of lab assignments is to provide a workbook file associated with each lab. It lists the items that will be submitted for grading to a TA or your instructor and the weight of each item. So what you need to do is provide the results of your lab assignments directly on the workbook and then submit that workbook for grading. Now, please make sure that you notice that some items consist of an instructor's or teaching assistant's initials. You need to show somebody that your circuit is operating. You will receive no credit for that section unless those initials are provided. Now, a couple of notes about lab workbooks. In Lab Zero, I talk about lab notebooks. A lab notebook is an official document that provides a running description of the work that you do. The lab workbooks contain only significant results for grading. Now, some of the labs refer to keeping track of information in lab notebooks. I would prefer that you do that, but we aren't going to be grading the notebooks. So your lab notebook should be created, but it is, it is at the student's discretion and will not be graded. At some point in your instruction career, you will need to create a lab notebook and keep it. Now, items that are to be included in the workbook, in order to find those easily, they are called out in the lab assignment itself. You'll notice that there are some boxes in the margin of the lab assignment. They are color-coded to indicate what should be done. So some boxes indicate that you are to do an analysis at this point. Generally, the results of that analysis need to be included in your lab workbook for submission for grading. Lab assignments are, of course, rather equipment intensive. We suggest that you have the following equipment. Digilance EE board. In addition, you should have a handheld digital multimeter and a Digilant analog parts kit. Now, this equipment is not necessarily required. It is certainly possible to complete the labs with other equipment, for example, bench equipment available at some universities, but we don't guarantee that it will be easy to do, do the labs with alternate equipment. For example, not all oscilloscopes will allow you to record your data to a file. We do have that requirement on a number of these lab assignments. That concludes our basic outline of the overall lab assignments. We're now going to start talking specifically about Lab Zero. 
Our goals for Lab Zero are first to introduce the basic lab equipment. We will be using a solderless breadboard in this experiment. We'll look at DMM usage. We will also look at using power supplies. We will make some basic measurements to show how to use this equipment. For example, we'll measure resistance, we'll identify open and short circuits, and then finally we'll implement a dependent source using a MOSFET. The first piece of equipment I want to show is the solderless breadboard. Typically a solderless breadboard is a large plastic sheet with a bunch of holes in it. You can plug the terminals of circuit elements into these holes. Now, the EE board, the primary real estate on the front of the board, is a solderless breadboard. This is very typical of how they look. In order to use these properly, you need to understand the connectivity between the holes. These five holes here, you'll notice that these holes are organized in rows. All five holes in a particular row share the same voltage. They're electrically connected. Adjacent rows are not connected to one another. So if I want two terminals of two different elements to be at the same voltage, I plug them into holes in the same row. If I want another terminal to be isolated from that node, I plug it into some other row. Now, exceptions to that are these rows here that have the blue stripe and the red stripe next to them. Okay. All of the holes next to the red stripe share the same voltage. Okay, so if I plug a circuit element into here and I plug another circuit element in here, those will share the same voltage. Likewise for the row of holes next to the blue stripe. These are an easy way to get power to your circuit elements because you have a possibility of applying power all the way along the circuit board. Now in order to measure voltages, currents, and resistances, typically we use voltmeters to measure voltage, ammeters to measure amps or current, and ohmmeters to measure resistance or ohms. DMMs, which stands for digital multimeters, generally combine all of those capabilities. DMMs come in a couple of different flavors. It's very common to have a handheld DMM, such as this one. Okay. Now, the choice as to whether to measure a voltage, a current, or a resistance is selected on the meter itself. For example, this V with a straight bar next to it indicates a voltage measurement. More than that, it represents a constant voltage measurement or a DC voltage measurement. There's a V with a little sinusoidal wave next to it, which is for measuring sinusoidal signals. We won't worry about that one yet. So if I flip this switch to the V with a bar next to it, I'm indicating to this meter that I want to measure a voltage. I will plug one of the leads that I'm going to use to measure a voltage into the port labeled COM. The other lead will be plugged into the port labeled volt ohm, and in this particular case it's hertz or C for capacitance. So depending on whether you're measuring a voltage or a resistance, you'll plug into this terminal here. The resistance measurement is done by turning this knob to the ohm setting. Okay? To measure a current, we have a few different options. In general, we'll use this one. The A with a bar next to it or a sinusoid measures current. Now in order to measure current with this you have to restructure these wires. One of the leads is plugged into the COM port, the other one goes into the current port. Notice that this has two different current capability measurements. One is labeled as 20 amps, the other one is 400 milliamps. To measure a low current, you would plug this terminal into this port. To measure a higher current, you plug it into this port. Now this is important. If you try to run too much current through one of these ports, it will blow out a fuse in this device. Okay, It's not a big deal, but you have to replace the fuse. In general, what you want to do when you're measuring a current is to measure it first on the high current.